Okay, where's my coffee? So we start always with saying a blessing on the coffee. I do want to uh, apologize. Today's class start is is really not morning. It's Sunday morning, a Torah and coffee. It's afternoon already. I was, uh, I guess, unfortunately officiating at a, at a funeral, and uh, therefore <clears throat> the class is later today than the usual Sunday uh, schedule time. So, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the title of the class is Afghanistan, a Torah perspective. And we might walk away with more questions than answers. But, so then you might ask, okay, what's the point of the class? The point of the class is we might have some answers and also, you know, view things from the lens of Torah. And I will make clear that believe, because I'm not an expert in this field, nor am I a uh, sort of Torah expert in this field, uh, but nevertheless, I have uh, seen and heard and uh, you know, done some studying, not enough time for research. I would have liked to have had more time and perhaps we'll, we'll have the time to do so. So <clears throat> definitely some sort of perspectives and food for thought of how Torah approaches this. I also, towards the end of this class, because my father's yard site, the, my father's anniversary day of passing is tonight, I wanna mention a story, the one memory that I have of my father, because he passed away when I was really a, a young child, and I mention this every year, I believe I share this last year, but I do in his honor, uh, will mention the story again so that we can learn from it and hopefully you'll be inspired by it and, uh, and, uh, and put that inspiration into action for the blessing and aliyah, elevation of my father's uh, soul. So that we'll uh, get to as well. And there's two st topics, Afghanistan, Torah perspective, and my father are s somewhat connected as, as I will explain. So. Afghanistan, a Torah perspective. I also want to make it very clear that as much as possible, I will stay away from the political, the politics of this, because that's not the agenda here. It's not what this class is about. This is not about uh, the political, uh, either perspective or, or ramifications of it. This is more um, a, a, a Torah perspective, although maybe that will be touched upon where absolutely necessary. <clears throat> so. You know, there, there's several issues that um, can be uh, addressed over here from a, from a Torah perspective in terms of the situation in Afghanistan. So, first and foremost, and, and primary from... from, from uh, uh, absolutely primary over here is the what are our responsibilities and I say our as Americans as American Army what are our responsibilities in preserving life in the value of life and protecting life as a result of us being in Afghanistan so and and, and therefore the question is by us sort of leaving Afghanistan um, you know, is, is that okay? Is that okay? Do we have a responsibility to protect since we are there? Now, I know that this discussion has been had in general. What are the responsibilities of the United States of America wherever there is conflict throughout the world? Uh, there's been the discussion, you know, we cannot police the world. Are we obligated to, you know, fly in our soldiers, put their lives on the line? To, uh, to, uh, to stop, whether it's genocide, whether it's killing uh, even of one person, uh, do we have that obligation as, as a superpower? As a superpower, you know, that comes with responsibility. Uh, we are a force of stability in the world. Uh, hopefully that continues. And that's a, a, a big merit in a sense, but that also comes with responsibilities. And this is a conversation, a discussion that's been had and I'm not going to really address that. That's more complicated. 
because that's not the situation in Afghanistan, meaning the situation in Afghanistan is a little bit more straightforward, although it has its complications, as I will uh, try to articulate. The situation in Afghanistan is not just any place, it's a place that we have been there. We have been there, and we have spent 20 years there, invested a lot of money, um, created a certain infrastructure, and here the question comes from a purely, again, Torah perspective, a moral, ethical, Jewish perspective. Do we have an obligation to protect life as, as, uh, as, as, a, a, as, as not just, you know, we're there. Can we leave and put life on the line? Or, or you know, it's a, a pretty definite, it's a pretty given that people, innocent people, will be killed as a result of us leaving there. Now, I want, I want, to, I want to, you know, perhaps quote some Torah sources, as again, this is not just my personal opinion, although I want to stress again and again, these are my observations. Uh, I'm not a halachic authority and expert in this. I haven't reviewed all the sources. This is more in the line of Sunday morning Torah schmoozing and discussion. So this is not like a final, this is, this is, this is, uh, 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 thinking out loud, this is not conclusions. Uh, so just, just bear that in mind. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Maimonides, who co codifies much of Jewish law, and I don't have the Maimonides in front of me, Maimonides, who codifies much of Jewish law, says, he talks about Malchai Yisrael, he talks about the role of the Jewish king that when it has its authority, talks about the fact that the Jewish king has a responsibility to rid the world of what he terms Rishay HaOilam, the evil people of the world. In other words, he says that not only do they have the obligation of ridding the people uh, of, of, of those of evil within their own midst, but he talks about in a, gra in a, in a greater term, and this is at a time where there wasn't you know, the world wasn't as small as it is today, and nevertheless, Maimonides, in basing himself on Talmudic and Torah sources, says that Malchi Yisrael have an obligation to get rid of Rishay HaOilam, the wicked of the world. Now, <clears throat> um, in our situation over here in Afghanistan, um, it becomes more complicated. And let me first talk about the complication and then where it's, what I believe is fairly simple. Uh, simple, relatively speaking. The complication over here is that um, there are two groups. I'll divide it into two groups or three groups of uh, the citizens or people that we have responsibilities or possible responsibilities in Afghanistan. One group is, of course, the American soldiers, American personnel, American citizens that were there for all these years uh, in um, assisting, in nation building, whatever, whatever term you want to give it. Um, we have an obligation, and I think that goes without any question, that we have an obligation to do whatever it takes to... to, um, to uh, save these people, to protect these people, without a doubt. And I'm saying this not just politically as, as a country, but from a Torah perspective. Um, let's take the other extreme. The other extreme is the Afghan people that had nothing to do uh, with, with the Americans, nothing to do with supporting America's role. They were totally um, uh, just, you know, people living in the countryside, in the cities, and so on. And now the Taliban comes in, ISIS perhaps comes in, and uh, and starts to uh, and starts to murder uh, women, children, whatever it might be, or or, or just anybody who, who or Christians of other religions. Um, what is our obligation to protect them now that we are there? Now that we are there, and here it gets a little more complicated. And the, one of the reasons why it gets a little more complicated is because it's very hard to define who is wicked and who is not. You know, as as American Marines, <clears throat> and I heard this from a second hand, someone who spoke to a, a Marine that served in Afghanistan, he says, you don't know, one day 
the same person is with the Americans, the next day is with the Taliban, you know, they just change, just, there's no, there's no, you know, the allegiances change from here to today, you don't, you don't know. So talking about the Rishi HaOlam, the wicked, it's very, very hard, I'm being told this, to define um, who is and who isn't, who, do, who, and, and therefore, I would think, I would think that it is not our role, responsibility, to defend that segment of society. It is the role of sort of the Afghan people, country, nation, and so on, to defend. I don't say this with certainty. I say this with some hesitation, okay? Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, the people who openly assisted you know, it was the, the Afghani citizens who were interpreters, who were uh, people who openly assisted the Americans. To me, it seems quite clear, again, based on Jewish sources and so on, it seems quite clear that we have an absolute obligation to um, protect uh, those lives, without a doubt, because... Um, we have an obligation to protect life in general, and these individuals who we promised, there's also a, 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 a Jewish law and there's support for that on various levels that if you that you are absolutely obligated to, to keep your promise. In fact, in last week's parasha we said, tishmar. you have an obligation to keep your promise. So we have an absolute obligation to keep our word and promise to these people who over the years have assisted us and we have guaranteed them their security. Um, so here, the value of life, coupled with the clarity of who we are protecting, seems to be very clear and obvious that we have an obligation to save these people from from murderers, killers, and, and etc. Um, So, now, you, the question which becomes a little more complicated is, do you have an obligation to put your life on the line to protect these people? Now, I, I, I'll, I'll steer clear of that discussion, um, or maybe not. I would say that, by and large, you know, there is a posic of value trying to quote Torah sources. There is a Torah statement. Of, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mandate in the Torah. Lo ta'amod al dam re'echo. You shall not stand on your fellow's blood. And as every verse in the Torah is interpreted, both in the Talmud and in the other sources, Rashi makes it very clear, the Talmud makes it very clear, that what does this mean? That if you see somebody uh, that is being attacked by... Uh, by others, by a band of robbers, you see, uh, by bandits, you see uh, someone being uh, drowning. So the Torah tells you that you are obligated to go ahead and save them. And by the way, this is uh, different than civil law. I know I did as a part of becoming a chaplain here for the Coral Springs Police Department. And um, I want to mention uh, in memory of, uh, of Officer uh, Johnson, I believe is his name, I really do apologize if I got his name wrong because I didn't get a chance to, to see much of the reports about him and, and it's been just hectic. A uh, member of the Coral Springs Police Department who passed away from COVID. Um, so uh, again, if I got his name wrong, I really do apologize, but we definitely uh, mourn over his loss. He was a very, very dear officer, dedicated his life for protecting the community and we, and we wish his we wish, we send wish, wishing and blessings to his family uh, that God should give them strength and comfort uh, and protect all other members, our first responders and members of the police, fire department, etc., health personnel. But getting back here to our subject, so <clears throat> I remember when I took, in order to become a chaplain for the police department, I took the Citizens Academy, which uh, anybody could take, but that was a requirement for, for me to become a chaplain. And the law in in Florida is that you do not you're not obligated civil law does not obligate you to get involved in someone else who is in a position of danger but of course moral law 
And Torah law and God's law says, yes, you are obligated. Now, you do not have to put your life on the line uh, to save someone else. However, the reason why uh, over here it seems to be that this was a fairly clear cut is because the reports uh, that have been coming out of Afghanistan, and uh, I hope I'm right on this because it's hard to know sometimes you know which reporting is accurate in today's world environment, but apparently, you know, we had a force of 2,500 uh, soldiers and then Afghani forces, and uh, there was more like a peacekeeping force than <clears throat> a force that was being that was in danger. In other words, for the last I don't know 16, 18, 19 months. I'm not exactly sure. I think 16 months. <clears throat> thank God there has not been any uh, American casualty. So, <clears throat> based on that, it seems quite clear that we have and have an obligation to make sure <clears throat> that, of course, American personnel and any Afghani personnel that we have, uh, that have helped us and we've worked with them, and possibly even broader than that, possibly even to Afghani citizens in general, where, as mentioned before, it could be a little complicated, that the value of life is so incredible, the value of every single life, you know, <clears throat> Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year, but you violate Yom Kippur in order to save a life, and many, many other examples. Uh, you know, if you have a conquering force, and, it's, and the conquering force says, give us one person that we want to kill, or we will kill all of you, you don't even give out, you don't even hand over that one person, because the value of life is infinite. And therefore, it would seem to me, based on these Torah moral values, that we have an obligation to, to do whatever it takes to, to save life. How long? Uh, as long as it takes, I think. Uh, that's how long. As long as we have the means, uh, and it is relatively, especially if it's a, if it's a small force, um, now, it's easier for me to say that, and I say that with sensitivity. I, I, you know, I'm not serving over there. I don't have family that's serving in, in Afghanistan. But, you know, we do have, you know, we have 35,000 soldiers or 30,000 soldiers in, in different parts of the world, whether it's Germany or Korea or wherever it is. I'm not sure of the numbers. Um, and that's, that's for American interests, whether our being there at this time would have served an American interest. Ich weiß nicht. I don't know. That's... A political conversation and that's definitely many uh, uh, greater pundits so to speak who are experts in foreign policy that know the answer but I would think that saving life in a place of such instability where immediately uh, there's a risk of so much lives and let's talk about the first two categories Americans which I know we're making every effort to get them out and 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 you know Absolutely, you know, applaud all those who are who are doing so, whether it's from the political world, whether it's starting with the, the president and and, and 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 all those who are doing whatever they can. Uh, I'm not here to analyze who is to blame, the, the current president or, or or the previous president. That's not the discussion. It's not my place. The, right now, we're talking about a perspective in terms of saving life lives, and that I believe. And again, from a Torah perspective, is absolutely clear. And I want to, I want to, uh, clear that it is an obligation that, based on the risks over here, and the, uh, and the investment right now, that, that it it is an obligation for us as a country to do so. Um, for how long? I asked this question before. I think for as long as it takes, but. But that's perhaps more complicated. But right now, based on what we've seen, we have that obligation. And I want to I want to use this as a as a uh, as a, as a uh, the word slips my mind, but as a as a sort of uh, uh, stepping stone, I guess, for my next conversation regarding my my father. Um, Rabbi Yosef Arya ben Avram Simcha, you could say al for the elevation of his neshama today, or tonight, or tomorrow, I would greatly appreciate it. And I, I use this to connect the two points, because my father, as you've known, I've shared this 
many times here was an Auschwitz survivor. And, and, and just imagine that if, and we, and we have this uh, resentment till today where the Americans were flying over and they could bomb Auschwitz. And every day, 6,000 Jews were being killed in Auschwitz. A bomb, one bomb in Auschwitz on the railroads leading to Auschwitz, one American plane which would cripple those, the, the, the tracks could have saved thousands and thousands of lives. But we didn't do so. The explanation was it took away from the war effort, whatever the explanation is. But imagine, and I don't have to imagine, you know, you have family um, that, that perished, and I have family that perished in the Holocaust, and you're able to stop that, that killing, you know, why wouldn't you do so? Um, so, you know, countries, it's America, it's Afghanistan. When it comes to the value of life, these borders are artificial. If we could save life, and in a relatively, at this point, easy way, um, easy is not the right word, but in a relatively safe way, um, we should do it. We should do it. That's part of who we are. In addition, to the conversation that in the long term, and this is a, a real foreign policy question, but it, but it also touches on life saving. And it was if we don't honor this protection to the ones who we've made our promise and commitment to, how does that jeopardize the safety of Americans in future uh, operations, future activities? But that's that's a, a, a we'll put that conversation aside. Although it's an important element of it, but we'll I'm talking more on the immediate. Uh, obligation to save lives and I want to make it clear this is not a critique of, of any political party I don't know if um, they really had strong evidence that this wasn't going to collapse as it, it collapsed um, they did everything according to the best way they understood so this is not a critique it really isn't there's, there's there's a place and time, but not here, um, to evaluate that. Here, in this conversation, I'm dealing with the right now. Right now, if we have the means and the possibility to save and protect even one life, we need to do so. That's what this conversation is about. I want to conclude with, with, a, a, uh, with a, um, a story of my dad. I, I have, you know, to honor my dad, I've mentioned this story last year, but there's another maybe one or two nuances, not that the story has changed. My memory maybe changed from last year, but the story hasn't changed. You know, my dad, as I mentioned, was a Holocaust survivor, um, and he passed away when I was five years old, and just turned five. Basically four was just a, a couple of weeks after my, a month after my birthday, my fifth birthday. And tragically, he for I think like a year and a half or so, he suffered from lung cancer, which can be, I'm told by medical uh, doctors, by medical professionals, that that could also have been a byproduct or a result of, of living in Auschwitz. You know, we talk about six million, but how many people died of disease because of malnutrition, because of being exposed to the worst environments, toxic environments, and so on. So. I have no no memories, no real memories, because I was uh, I was basically three and a half or four years old when he became ill. I only have one memory, one memory that I cherish and that I share every single year in connection to his yard site, his annual, his his uh, his the, the 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 day of his passing. The <clears throat> my father was in the hospital, in and out for treatment. He came home one day. I remember being in my parents' bedroom, a child, I loved my father. He loved me because I was his, he loved all his children, but I was his only son, I had two older sisters. Uh, so, you know, there's an extra connection, at least I, I, <laughs> I like to think so. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't even make a bracha on the coffee. Let's do the bracha for a second. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Shehakol Niyah Bidvaro. So, I, um, 
I, uh, we were in the bedroom, my dad came in, and I remember asking my father to pick me up. And my mom said in Yiddish, and I always like for a thumbs up for Yiddish, my mom said in Yiddish, er kann nicht, er ist zu schwach. He cannot, he is too weak. My father bent down, and he lifted me up, he picked me up. And that's the end of the story. And I share this story both uh, as a message, both on a human level and on a spiritual level and on a Jewish level. On a human level, you know, there must have been other interactions during that stage of my life, but this is the only thing that became uh, etched in my memory. A father, and I'm, I, I'm, you know, if my mother would not have said he's too weak, it probably would not have been etched in my memory. It's probably because I sensed, even at that age, that he's making the effort that I remember this, that he lifted me up. So you never know, you never know what moment of effort that you put in to showing love and care to your child, what will become etched in your child's memory. So, so cherish, and you know, especially today we all live in a world of more distractions. Um, make that extra effort, make that extra effort, and you could, you could take this message and apply it, but if you take this message and apply it to your own loved ones, that will be a, me yeah, a memory to my father who made his effort when he was so ill uh, to, d to do so for his child. So please do so uh, also in his memory, uh, if you can. But that's not the most important. Do it. Do it for yourself. Do it for your child, of course, and for whichever loved one you're reaching out to. That's number one. Number two, on a spiritual level, um, you know, we are all, uh, we all interact with others. And when we have something to give and somebody's in need of receiving, that's analogous to a child and a parent. So when someone reaches out to you um, and, and needs a helping hand, a kind word, inspiration, whatever it might be, as difficult as it might be for you, make that effort to sort of bend down, to lower yourself from your position because you're now in a position of strength and that person needs you, and make that effort to lift them up, to raise them up. You don't know how far that goes and the impact it will have on their life, and in turn, what that will continuously perpetuate with others. That's lesson number two on a sort of spiritual level. And I also want to say on a, on a Jewish level, is that we are, and on a spiritual, godly level, we are all God's children. All of mankind is God's children. God refers to us, Banim Atem Lashem Elokeichem, you are God's children. If we turn, and this was another lesson that somebody pointed out to me yesterday from this story, you know, if I would not have reached out and asked for my father to lift me up, he probably wouldn't do it. Maybe yes, maybe not. But it was because I initiated and I asked that he bent down and made that effort. In Kabbalistic, term, Kabbalistic terms, that's called Esrusa de la Tata, the arousal from below arouses and awakens a revelation from above, Etruta ta de la Tata, de la Ela, sorry. The arousal from above which brings forth, in other words, your request and your initializing the situation, you're reaching out, you're making yourself ready and willing and asking for that, for that flow, for that positive sort of flow, love, energy, godliness, blessings, brings out a deeper uh, response from, the, from God Almighty, so to speak, to shower you with what you need and your blessings and in turn lift you up. However, and very much apropos with the month of Elul, now is the month of Elul where the Alter Rebbe tells us that it's analogous to a king in the field. During the high holidays, God is sort of in his palace, which is a little bit more difficult to approach 
During the month of El, God comes out to the field like a king that comes out to the field and it's easier to approach and to ask and so on. But you need to go ahead and welcome the king. You need to show an interest. So now during this time of the year, it's, it, it is so apropos that we initiate that request, that turning to Hashem, that realizing that there's more to life than just the mundane, the material, the, the, the comforts that we seek, but there is there is a creator, there is a purpose, there's a mission, there is Rosh Hashanah coming up, there's Yom Kippur coming up. We have we have meaning in life. If we turn and ask and stretch out our hands, so to speak, stretch out our arms, so to speak, God in turn responds from an even higher, greater level and and fulfills our request and helps us reach those greater important goals in life so <clears throat> that is that is uh, what I wanted to share in honor and memory of my father uh, I hope that these words will inspire you to reach out to God Almighty to reach out and try to lift up another fellow human being that is in need raise them higher and uh, that will be for this host for the memory of my father all of us shalom and uh, in turn, may it, uh, may it bring down much blessings to all of us collectively. And uh, please sort of share these words of Torah. Uh, I do want to say that this coming Wednesday, we now do our, uh, <clears throat> our food distribution, the larger food distribution. We do food distribution all the time, almost daily. But the larger community food distribution which is done on Wednesdays, is done every other Wednesday. This week we have a food distribution. We can use volunteers. And if this did, would be a, a great mitzvah to put in your into your uh, sort of resume <coughs> onto the scale as we approach Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We really could use and appreciate the help. I thank you for all those who have helped. Until now, please share these words of Torah. Have a fantastic week. If you have any questions or comments on our discussion, please reach out and uh, we will try to respond. Have a fantastic and blessed week.